Um, we're going to go straight into it. We're going to talk about the gut feeling, brain-gut connection. It's not a very hard topic for medicine. It's something which is very new and emerging, even though we've had inklings before that the brain-gut interaction is an important one. It has not been studied very formally up until a few, maybe last five, six years when most of the information really has come to the fore. All right, so the components, these questions which I'm gonna offer to you don't need to be answered out loud. Answer them for yourself. I know some speakers have pre-prepared questions, but I didn't have time to submit them, unfortunately. So we have three pre-test questions which you're going to just run through, answer each one, decide if the answer is true or false, and at the end, we'll see if we transmitted any information to you. So for the first one, the components of the brain-gut axis include the hypothalamus, is that true or false? Pituitary, true or false? The adrenal glands, enteric nervous system, and the microbiome. So the microbiome in humans is comprised of tiny epithelial cells that absorb bacterial products. Is that true or false? Is well recognized to cause diseases such as depression. Is that true or false? Can it be changed? Can you change the microbiome using antibiotics? Does it play a simple role in obesity and diabetes? Does the microbiome play a role there? Is the microbiome in humans virtually the same across modern humans? True or false? The brain-gut interaction. Can it explain why you would feel butterflies in the stomach if I called out your name right now? Like Ann Chin? No butterflies, Ann? Yeah. Patrine Meeks? Butterflies in the stomach? She says no. Mm. What about Shireen Dawkins Cox? Each time you have butterflies in the stomach, feelings of nervousness, it's coming from somewhere. All these terms we use suggest a connection between the brain and the mind, which we will explore. So this morning we heard that your PSJ president was absent, so I brought her for you. <laughs> Everyone has a head, and inside that head, there must be a brain, but all our brains are not the same. Some brains are different than others. Some brains are a little tinier than others. So what's on the brain? Well, your brain is supposed to tell you what to do, right? So obviously it's the director of the system. So the individual's brain will determine what that person does. Your brain is a complex organ. It's a control of everything. Very many areas. The motor area controls how your voluntary muscles move. The sensory area, what you perceive from the environment, temperature touch. Pressure, pain, the frontal lobe, your movement, problem solving, your behavior, personality, all these things determined by the brain. Different areas control speech, Broca's area, for example, the brain stem, which controls all your reflexes, your consciousness, your breathing, heart rate, everything directed by the brain. Your occipital lobe, so you can actually see the slides that we put up. And then Wernicke's area, which was tested this morning, which tests your language and comprehension, which some people have failed. And then cerebellum, which helps you to walk up to accept your prizes for being here for 25 years. I didn't see any males come up, though. Mm, interesting. So the brain is a director, yes? It tells you exactly what to do. But is it just a one-way direction? Does the brain tell you without hearing anything back? Well, the structure of the central nervous system allows it to do that by sending nerves out to all the parts of the body, but it's a very complex system. Signals go out from the brain and return to the brain along different types of nerves. The most important nerve for this morning's discussion is the vagus nerve, not Las Vegas and not 
Mr. Vegas. The vagus, vagus nerve. The vagus nerve is a part of your autonomic nervous system. It's a tenth cranial nerve coming from the brain stem. Autonomic nervous system divided into two parts, parasympathetic and sympathetic system. So at the base of the brain, the vagus nerve here is coming from brain stem and it runs down through the skull and out right through the middle of your chest and it releases little nerves to all the necessary organs to pr produce its function. So the sympathetic system is responsible for your f flight and fight response. So it innervates the eye, causing constriction of the pupil. It can increase your heart rate. It can make you feel queasy because it activates the intestine. So it causes closure of your sphincters and it can cause contraction of the stomach. It can activate glucose metabolism in the liver. It can affect secretion of cortisol from the adrenal gland, causing um, a more stress response. It can also affect your um, genital urinary system, causing bladder spasm or control of your um, sphincter func functions. And the parasympathetic nervous system does the exact opposite. So they act in opposite to kind of control your primitive reflexes. For the purposes of this morning, we're going to focus on the autonomic nervous system and how it affects the intestine. So normally we need to just orient ourselves. So the intestine for this talk would be from the mouth, down the esophagus, stomach, small intestine, and colon. There is a bidirectional communication between your brain and your enteric nervous system. It's a very crude system. It's not a smartphone that you're using, so it's not, you know, well on ordered, but it does allow communication to go both ways. Your brain talks to your gut and your gut talks back to the brain so that you can function normally. So the autonomic nervous system then is three parts, sympathetic, parasympathetic, and the enteric nervous system. And enteric refers to intestine. So there's a nervous system that's embedded in the intestine. And it's a very complex system, just like how the brain's interconnections are complex. Similarly, inside the intestine, the, the connections are also very complex. The somatic nerves in the central nervous system, which control the body, largely start in the spinal cord and run straight through to the end organ, which is usually muscle. In the autonomic nervous system, the synapse or connect in the autonomic ganglia, which run along the inside of the chest. And then the nerves will go to different organs at different levels, causing their effects. The primary neurotransmitter, which allows nerves to fire, is acetylcholine, which is released from the end of the nerve. And then that will now act on whatever receptor is there to produce the effects that we described before in terms of affecting your um, digestion by releasing enzymes or contracting muscles, opening sphincters, and causing you to have a normal working system. Now, this cartoon represents the intestine, just any part of the intestine. It could be small bowel, large bowel. The point is that there are two main components to the nervous system of the intestine. So there is an inner layer of nerves, which is going to control the inner surface of the intestine. And this inner layer is basically com coming from the vagus nerve through the submucosal layer. So the layer just below the absorptive surface. And that is known as the submucosal plexus, which basically brings fibers down and innervates on the innermost part of the bowel, causing control of the secretory functions of the bowel. So whenever something comes into the intestine, if it's a small bowel segment, you'll release your enzymes. As long as your inner layer of nerves is intact, you can sense what is there and you can respond to it. In terms of contraction of the muscle, because the muscle is surrounding the bowel, in the myenteric layer, there's a myenteric plexus. So there are two, basically, um, networks, an inner network controlling the secretion and release and an outer network, which basically controls the muscular, con muscular contraction. And then there are connections between the two layers and connecting inside to cause an effect, and then also connecting back to the main vagus nerve and going back to the brain. 
So you might sit there thinking, well, where are we going with this? Well, the reality is as you sit and think, you are not quite the only one who is sitting and thinking about all of this. You are made up of multiple creatures. You are not alone. You have a microbiome. Everyone here has as many cells inside of them as they do which belong to them. And these cells are all living. So 10 to the 13, or 10 trillion cells which match the same number of cells roughly as your own cells. And these are all microorganisms, bacteria, funguses, and um, protozoa. All of them live within your body. Most of them in the intestinal tract, some of them on the skin, in the genital urinary system. And each, each one has a weight to it. If you were to put them all together, one to two kilograms of your body weight is made up of all these microorganisms. So if you get overweight, you can blame them. There are thousands of them in there. We can't identify all of them. We're not even identified half of them, even though um, we've identified some of them. So if there are so many, and we're discovering more and more every day, but we know they're there. So they also have names, many names which you are all familiar with, lactobacilli, bifidobacteria, mycobacteria. The names are not super important because the fact is that we don't know what they do. But we know they're there and we're naming them more and more. And so that's going to help us eventually to combat some kind of illness. So in essence, you're a symbiotic person then. You're living in harmony with your bacteria and the skin, in the GI tract, and in the genital urinary tract. And there is going to be some interplay because the numbers will vary depending on which part of the body we're talking about. Inside the stomach, we don't usually see any normal bacteria. It should be a sterile environment. H. pylori can be in your stomach, but it shouldn't be in there. It can cause problems. Further down in the small bowel is where you'll find about a million per gram of small intestinal um, bacteria. And then most of them would be inside your colon. So the colon is very rich in your microflora. So where do they come from? Well, when you're born, inside there it's sterile. When you're inside your mother's womb, there's no bacteria in there. So where did you get all of these? Well, you get most of them in the first year of life. As you're coming through the vaginal passageway, you're gonna pick up some from the vaginal path and then you're going to ingest those. And then most of the others, we're not quite sure where you'd have picked them up from, but we know the possibilities are endless. You could pick them up from <laughs> getting an alternate food source. So is this good or bad? Who knows, we'll see. The point is that the maternal microbiota, so the mother's microbiome, the mother's bacterial load, is very important in what happens when the baby is born. So they will transfer a significant amount of bacteria at the point of delivery, during breastfeeding and daily interactions. And then as the baby is growing up, consuming the normal diet, they will consume more bacteria in the environment and be exposed to more and more, making up the normal individual's uh, microbiome. So this is going to vary, obviously, because we all don't come from the same environment and mother. So everyone has a unique individual microbiome. Now, there are some things which will make your microbiome at birth more healthy. So the healthy things are if you have a vaginal delivery, that's good for your microbiome because you pick up your normal maternal um, bacteria. If you're delivered at term as opposed to preterm, that's also good. Breastfeeding is good in terms of transferring this microbiome from the mother. And then exposure in early childhood to a lot of bugs. So the more germs you're exposed to, the better actually as you're growing up. If you're growing up in a sterile environment, then you're not going to be priming your immune system to handle your world. I mean, if you stay in the bubble all the time, then that's great, but you will go out and experience uh, more um, what we call antigens or epitopes, which can 
cause some immune disorders because your immune system was not recognizing these as being normal early enough. Negative impacts then would be cesarean section, which obviously would deprive the baby of that initial um, load. The premature deliveries for the same reason. Um, formula milk versus breastfeeding also reduces or changes your microbiome in a negative way. And then exposure, early exposure to antibiotics in infancy um, or the perinatal period also changes the microbiome in a negative way. So pushing it more towards so-called bad bacteria. So to make the healthy baby, it should go the more natural route with exposure to many organisms, the primary immune system, so you can recognize a lot of um, environmental potential threats and form a healthy immune system versus a sterile environment where your immune system gets a chance to only wake up later and not be um, as good as rec at recognizing threats. So there are a number of bacteria which you'll pick up at the various stages, but as you get older, you'll find that you will slow down in the amount of biodiversity. So most of the um, organisms are picked up in that first year of life. You hardly pick up things as an adult in terms of new microbiome, but you can by altering your environment as we're gonna just briefly touch on. So this is good because it reduces the likelihood of things like asthma, allergic rhinitis, type 1 diabetes, and celiac disease, in addition to also reducing the likelihood of metabolic diseases like obesity and diabetes. So if you don't have a dog licking your face as a baby, you're at a disadvantage. <laughs> so these microbes that you've acquired through life, they work for you. They're not just there hanging out, talking to you. They work, they complete your digestion, they produce vitamins, vitamin B and K, and they act on some things that you eat, and they either increase the activity of drugs that you consume or change your metabolism somehow. So they're working to basically produce substances which are beneficial to the host. Otherwise, if they're toxic to the host, they themselves can't survive. So they have to be doing something beneficial. They change the pH in the intestine by some of the products that they re release and make the environment unfavorable for so-called bad bacteria. So they're beneficial to you. Most of the ways they do this is by producing short-chain fatty acids, which to them is an energy source and also is an energy source for you. It promotes glucose and energy homeostasis. So it also regulates the immune response and inflammation, as we said before, and then it regulates also some hormones which control how much you eat. So we do know that the microbiome can affect how much you consume and what your appetite um, levels are. Tumor suppression, it's possible for short-chain fatty acids to suppress cancer cell growth as well, so we think this may be beneficial in patients who um, have an unfavorable microbiome, you may be at risk. And then regulating the central and peripheral nervous system would be one of the general functions because it interacts with the vagus nerve and sends signals back to the brain. It does cause your microbiome, as it's acting or working, to produce gases as well. So the ones you're familiar with, hydrogen sulfide, ammonia, hydrogen, methane, carbon monoxide and dioxide are all produced by your microbiome, depending on what you put into the intestine. Some foods are more gas producing than others, but it's the bacteria inside which act on that and produce these effects. So how do we know that this is really true? Well, if you want to do anything um, in science, you need to get some mice, and you need to start experimenting. So they took some mice, and they created a strain of mice which have to get fat because they took the fat suppressing gene out. And so these mice, when they eat the same amount of food as a normal mice, they get fat. And these are called OB, OB mice. And what they did was they took the stool from a normal mouse, so all the gut bacteria in the stool, they mixed it up and fed it to two strains of mice. So the normal donor 
In other words, this stool came from someone, a mouse rather, <laughs> who did not have, even though we have done human stuff, um, who does not have um, a microbiome from the OB, OB mouse. So this stool is just like normal mouse stool. And they gave it to the mouse, and then the mouse became, was normal, basically. So normal mouse, normal stool, no change. Now this mouse was a normal mouse, and they gave this normal mouse the stool from a mouse who has one of the OB, OB mice, and the mouse became fat. So the stool, with the same amount of diet, made the mouse fat. And then this mouse now, they gave the mouse stool from underweight strains of rat, and nothing else changed, and those mice became underweight. So it was something in the stool that was changing things, because the energy intake was the same across the board. And they could predict which mice would become fat or skinny, depending on what they were eating stool-wise. So don't try this at home, but <laughs> that's basical. And there are more mice available all the time, so lots of experiments to do. But there's definite proof that the microbiome will change things like your metabolism and environment inside, causing a negative or positive effect. So the environment is always changing in intestine, and the system is very, quote unquote, complicated. But briefly speaking, it does involve your brain as a driver and it sends your signals down the spinal cord and out the somatic nerves. And then in the autonomic system, it channels it through the vagus and it connects to your bowel. On the inside of the bowel, there are going to be some bacteria. And those bacteria basically will produce these short chain fatty acids and some other metabolites which are absorbed because the bacteria themselves are not absorbed. It's just what they produce that's absorbed. And these will stimulate the same vagus nerve and send signals back up to the brain. So there's a connection which goes brain telling the intestine what to do when something is in it. And the intestine responds and tells the brain what to do depending on what's stimulating the intestine. And as you know, the brain, because it has all kinds of other control mechanisms, there can be overlap in some things, such as your um, things like uh, mood, anxiety levels, stress levels, behavior can be affected by what's in the intestine, depending on where it's sending the signals. Similar to how the brain will change things like how the intestine moves and produces um, substances to affect delivery of nutrients and also can change what type of bacterial load you have in the intestine. So whenever you can meddle, it's time to meddle. Because if you can find some medication to change all of these bacteria, then that's an advantage. And it's a beneficial pharmaceutical industry, so there's got to be some money in it. So it's going to happen, which obviously is what happened. So the thing about it is, there must be some harmony, obviously, between development of drugs and your microbiome, because you now you're potentially affecting normal people. So we got lots of mad scientists. Time to put things together, because bear in mind now, we don't know what is inside your bowel. We know there are bugs in there, but thousands of bugs, and we don't know all of them. And even the ones we do know, we don't know what they're doing. We just know they do something. Because when we move the whole stool across, something good happens. So now is the time to extract and give people stuff to take and see what happens when we change the microbiome. So this is where the industry is trying to um, jump in. So there are three methods by which you can alter the microbiome to have some kind of a positive effect. We can use antibiotics, prebiotics, or probiotics, and then there's a the symbiotics category. Antibiotics, pretty straightforward. Everybody knows what those are. Long time we've been using them. They kill or inhibit the growth of bacteria, and so straightforward when you take it, it targets whichever it's designed to and changes the intestinal microflora. And because we're not sure exactly what's in there, more likely than not, we're just kind of blindly shooting in there. Some are more specific, but we don't know 
what else we're getting rid of when we use antibiotics. So antibiotics, we know. Prebiotics, uh, relatively newer term. Oh, the probiotics first. The probiotics are the live bacteria. So these are live organisms. So if it's not a live probiotic that you're purchasing, then it's not doing anything apart from making the supplier wealthy. So you need to get live bacteria or funguses, depending on the probiotic type, which when administered in an adequate amount has a beneficial effect on the host. So it can't be just taking up a one little lactobacilli and swallowing it, because that's not enough to cause a beneficial effect on the host. So if it doesn't fulfill the criteria, then it's not a probiotic. It's just dirt. So you have to know how much of the, orga of the organism is going to cause a beneficial effect. Otherwise, you're not doing anything. And the problem is right now, we don't know. So you look at the bottles, and then there are like some say it's 10,000, and some say 10 million colony forming units, and some say it's this and that. And, but nobody knows what dose is supposed to do what. We're kind of, you know, we're trying to feel our way at the moment. We figure, okay, the more you take, the more it will stick in there and do something, but we don't know. It could be you need less, or you need this combination. Do we need lacto? Do we need bifido? Do we need um, sac? It is not quite defined yet what does what, but that's where we're heading. It must be safe for intended use, and so it could be a food, it could be a probiotic food, so like the yogurt thing, or it could be a supplement that you purchase, or it could be a drug a prescribed probiotic. The prebiotic is not the bacteria itself. The prebiotic is just whatever you take that makes the bacteria that's already there grow more. So it's some kind of food ingredient which is not digested by you, but aids the growth and activity of the bacteria in the GI tract, producing a health benefit. So these are less common, things like lactulose, which are non-absorbable disaccharide, which can be acted on by gut bacteria to cause a change in the pH and can be useful in patients with liver disease. Um, psyllium, which we find naturally in certain foods. These prebiotics promote your um, normal good intestinal flora. Symbiotics are combinations. If you're taking something that has a prebiotic and a probiotic, it's called a symbiotic. But these are not as commonly found. So we do know that the probiotics have a long history of being used. So it was first thought to be discovered as useful by um, a scientist in Eastern Russia who basically checked to see whether there was a different kind of bacteria in fermented milk which would change the amount of lactobacilli in the colon and make the colon acidic. But it only happened with fermented milk which suggested that there was some bacteria in the milk that was changing the flora in the colon. But he didn't go any further than that. In World War I, um, Alfred Niesel isolated E. coli from stool. So there was an outbreak of E. coli, of um, Shigella and Salmonella during the war. And then he found that the patients who had E. coli in the past didn't get the Salmonella and Shigella as often. So he thought maybe there was something in the stool which was preventing them from getting Salmonella and Shigella. Found those individuals, took their stool, and then gave it to, brave, the people who had Salmonella and Shigella. And it reduced the symptoms in that way. So very pioneering, early, brave man. Mm. So probiotics, we have them available, as you know. Usually we'll use them for diarrhea illnesses. Inflammatory bowel disease potentially could benefit. It's not very hard and fast. Allergies, um, so because the mechanisms that we discussed before involve altering the immune system, we think if we were to use probiotics early enough, we could affect things like allergy, cancer risk, because your immune system will be primed differently, thereby preventing you from developing cancer, if that were possible. Um, irritable bowel syndrome, we think, is associated with dysbiosis or an imbalance between your good and bad bacteria, predisposing you to things like diarrhea, for example. So we think changing the microflora could help there. Lactose intolerance, we know it's an enzyme deficiency, lactase, but we can always produce or give you 
bacteria which produce the lactase enzymes, so we can use it there. Hypertension, we can hope to try and change the target organs by changing your intestinal microflora and changing the way that you process either drugs or how you um, absorb substances which may predispose you to hypertension. Um, vaginosis, um, those conditions where we need to change the um, vaginal pH and microflora to prevent um, overgrowth of candida, for example. Kidney stones, by reducing absorption of calcium and uric acid, may help to reduce the incidence. Hepatic encephalopathy, which we spoke about before with the lactulose, the H. pylori treatments, and necrotizing enterocolitis in infants. All these conditions we think probiotics may be useful in, but we just don't have enough information or evidence at the moment. The early trials with antibiotic-associated diarrhea suggest that there is a benefit to giving a probiotic, usually with viral diarrhea, studied very well with rotavirus, give it within the first 48 hours and reduce the number of acute episode days from five to seven, to three to five. That's the supposed benefit. Um, there's not a lot of data though, and we're not sure which probiotics, how long, how much. Then the infectious diarrhea, so C. diff in particular, we know that um, right now the thrust is to do fecal microbiome transplant. So in those individuals who have Clostridium difficile, which is an antibiotic associated infectious diarrhea, we can take the stool from a normal donor and infuse it at the time of either a colonoscopy or an enema of stool into patients who have Clostridium difficile and treat without antibiotics um, Clostridium. Um, ulcerative colitis, again, minimal evidence suggesting the use of probiotics, but because of an inflammatory condition, changing the flora should reduce the amount of inflammation there without requiring any um, antibiotics or anti-inflammatories. And irritable bowel syndrome, especially those which are diarrhea predominant, Lactose intolerance, we know there's evidence to support the use of lactase-producing organisms there, although the research is very limited. Cancer would be a good area because of the immune um, boost that we know we can get with probiotics. But unfortunately, because there are so many different mechanisms involved, so many different receptors involved, and so many uncertain probiotic choices, even though we know theoretically they should detoxify carcinogens ingested or change the environment in intestine, and they can also um, inc improve um, cell health and increase cell death of abnormal cells. All these things can be proven in the lab, stimulating the immune system to fight cancer cells. None of these have progressed beyond either petri dish or early lab um, rat stages. So still a lot of work being done. H. pylori, we use the probiotics predominantly to improve compliance by reducing the side effects from antibiotic use for obvious reasons. And then as you sit there thinking, and everyone, all your bacteria in there are thinking along with you, we will do the post test. So it says pre, but it should be post. Components of the brain gut axis include the hypothalamus, yes or no? Yes, rousing answer. Mm -hmm. Thanks for participating this morning. The pituitary gland components, yes or no? Okay, yes. Adrenal gland, yes or no? Yes, so the adrenal gland for the stress response. Enteric nervous system, which is an integral part of it. Oh, is this easy ones you say yes to? Oh. The microbiome, yes. Okay, so the microbiome in humans is comprised of tiny epithelial cells that absorb bacterial products. Yes or no? Who says yes? Go to the back of the class. The microbiome is not an epithelial cell. It's actually the bacteria. So it is not true. Microbiome is well recognized to cause diseases such as depression. Hmm, the eyes now start squinting and saying, well, you never told me that. Yes, it can cause depression. So yes, it is recognized by those who know. <laughs> so yes, it's well recognized in the literature, but you have to read the literature. So it's true. 
It can be, you can change the microbiome using simple antibiotics. Yes. Plays a role in obesity and diabetes. Yes. It's virtually the same across modern humans. No, individual, very individual. So the brain-gut interaction can explain why you'd feel butterflies if I called out your name again, Anjin. No? Mm. Okay, so can it explain why some people are prone to irritable syndrome? Yes, yes, it can. Um, the brain-gut interaction involves mostly unidirectional signaling along the path of the trigeminal nerve. No, so it's bidirectional along the vagus nerve. And the brain dot interaction was the title of this talk. No. <laughs> it was called Gut Feeling, the Brain Gut Connection. I uh, thank you very much. <laughs> you. Yes, any questions based on the presentation? I mean They'll get a basket. They'll get a basket. No. <laughs> Why? <laughs> You're asking a question. Yes, the question. How does a fecal transport work? Okay, it works. So in C. diff, basically what happens is normally a, p a host who is marginal, so a very elderly or someone on chemotherapy or has immunosuppression from HIV or whatever, or someone who takes broad spectrum high dose antibiotics for a long time may develop diarrhea from C. diff because C. diff normally is a tiny commensal. It's one of those thousands in there. But if you wipe out everything else, the C. diff says, great, my turn, and it starts to proliferate and cause colitis or inflammation in the colon. But when you think about it, it's because you gave the antibiotics to wipe out everybody else and the C. diff is now taking over. So what you need to do now is get everybody else back in there to get rid of the C. diff, because the C. diff doesn't like all the other bugs in there. C. diff is not one of your good ones. It's just getting a chance to hang out in a little tiny apartment whilst everyone else in the building is doing what it's supposed to do. And when everyone else is gone, it starts to go into everybody else's apartment. So when you do stool transplant, what you're doing is getting everybody else and just pushing them back inside the colon. You don't care who's in the stool, you just want them back in there because you know normal stool should have everybody in there. If you took stool from somebody who just didn't have the one bug that's necessary to kick out the C. diff, it wouldn't work. But because the way they pool stool is literally a bank, and you go there, and they say, what do you want to do today? And I say, OK, I want to give you two of my stool samples. And they will pay you to take the stool, and they will you know, spin it down and turn it into a mushy thing and label it as F blah, 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 whatever. Freeze it, and then, so they have tons of these. And you usually do them in like colleges in the States where the students are very mm, about doing stuff. And so they have this bank of stool of supposedly normal people. They take a history and profile so they know exactly what you've been on, antibiotics, food, and blah, blah, blah. And then they take the stool, and then they start pushing it into people who have problems to see if they can fix the problem. And if they fix the problem, then they say, aha, uh -huh, this person's stool fixed that problem. Let me find what's inside the stool that did that. We don't know what's in there yet, because there's so many things, but we know something in the stool. So we try and keep doing that until we can figure out. So we know it works definitely for C. diff, for fecal transplant, and it's literally just putting the stool back inside with a, not a shovel, a um, colonoscope or a hose or, you know, crude. Sometimes they can pass a nasal gastric tube, but that's like going this way, so not so nice. So they put it in, leave it, and it fixes the C. diff. But it's a stool because it's getting all the good people back in there and pushing out the C. diff. Any other questions? Yes. Well, in recent times, we have seen an increase in the prescribing of enterogermino in practice. Um, but if diarrhea is called by, caused by a viral means, does it really reduce the duration of the diarrheal episode? OK, so I guess the straight answer simply is it might. Um, it, that's just one 
probiotic, which has been studied with like one type of diarrhea. T technically speaking, it didn't work with most diarrheas, but even when it did work, the percentage of individuals who responded was still very low, less than 50%, which is better than zero. And it wasn't um, all comers. It had to be done early, within the first 48 hours. The problem is we don't know which virus is causing the diarrhea. It's going to work, though, because we don't know. When they checked for it, it wasn't a specific you know, strain of virus, or it was just viral diarrhea. So the answer is that it may work. If we had hard and fast evidence, it would be flying off the shelf more. But we know it works, but it just doesn't work all the time for everything, just like any probiotic, basically. Especially for children, though it works with kids in the early stage of viral. Not so much the data for um, any other group is, is just not robust enough. Oh, so I see a, a hand there in the corner. Awesome. Or maybe it was not a question. Oh, oh yes. there we go. Can you hear me? Yes. Good morning. I was actually trying to search through my phone. Um, there was an a lovely coverage of gut bacteria health on TVJ, um, where it says um, propionic acid and gut bacteria actually influences autism. Yes. Could you speak on that for us, please? Okay, so just take everything I just said and just throw autism in there. <laughs> the reality is that we don't know how it does it. So mechanisms are all the same. Whether it's autism or depression or anxiety or IBS, any of your stress-related disorders, any disorders which have a central processing imbalance, meaning a primary neurological slash brain problem, we think can be influenced by the intestine because there's definitely a connection. If you change something inside, well, what they did was not necessarily for autism, but to get you to understand, they took the rats again, so two sets of rats. They have rats, rats that um, like to stay by themselves. Sorry, mice, rats, rats are not, it's mice. So the mice stay by themselves and not as part of the group, so they're like isolated. And then they took this stool from people who, um, or rats, rather, mice, who like to socialize and put it into the withdrawn mice, and they start to socialize. So they're like, whoa, there's something in here which changes the mood of the mice in the stool. That's all they change. Same thing, they had um, the mice that when you hang them up by the tail, the mouse just literally just stays there and doesn't do anything. It just flops by the tail straight down versus the mouse who you hold it by the tail and they start wriggling around and stuff. So they took the stool from the wriggler mouse and put it in the mouse that just hangs and the mouse just started to flop around. And they're like, well, there's something there which definitely primes the um, nervous system and causes excitation and stuff. So it's the same thing with autism, except that it's an association. So the, the same um, early exposure, like the first year of life, that's the important part, where your microbiome is supposed to prime the nervous system. And if it doesn't work or doesn't happen, then it can lead to all these potential things. And autism is just one thing where we think that there may be a connection, but it's, it's not very well worked out. It's an association. It needs to be you know, properly explored. Oops. Burning question, because they're running. I know. Go ahead. We were late. Yes? Can you just translate that for me? Pickles and sauerkraut. Comment on them in terms of if, the, if they're good. OK, yes. <laughs> Thank you very much. Dr. Mike Mills. <laughs> I want to thank
Thank you so much.